All right, so I have hit the record button um, and we will be streaming live to YouTube as well. Um, you guys that have joined us are in the webinar format. And basically what that means is you can see and hear us, but you do not have audio and visual. Uh, you don't have audio and um, visual yourself as in we don't see you. So you're just gonna get to watch us tonight, listen to us and soak up all the knowledge that we're gonna share. If you have questions, there's a and a function um, at the bottom. So for those that aren't familiar with Zoom, uh, if you hover your cursor on your laptop or tap if you're on mobile on your screen, it'll pop up a menu bar. You should have access to a chat function as well as the Q&A. Put all your questions that you wanna stump me with um, or you just want more clarification on in that Q&A section and use the chat to interact with Cole. Let him know if you're having technical difficulties, um, anything related to that, um, put in the chat function and he's gonna be monitoring that while I'm presenting this evening. Um, it looks like we have about 25 people on the call with us, which is awesome. Cole, if you'll take a moment again to drop that uh, welcome message in there with the sign-in sheet link. Um, the sign-in sheet, guys, if you'll take a minute to click on that, fill out the information, we'll send you an outdoor chatting, a sticker for doing it. Um, it's also a way for us to keep track of how many people we're serving um, so that we can continue to offer free programs like this. So it really is helpful if you guys take a moment, fill out that information for us, select whether you want a sticker, how many, we will mail that to you. If you give us a good mailing address and um, if you wanna sign up for our newsletter to stay informed with uh, the things that we're offering. Some of you are joining us from far, far away. Some of you are super close, right in our own backyard. Um, we are Outdoor Chattanooga. We are a unique division within the city of Chattanooga that promotes all things outdoors within about an hour's drive of city center. And we also do low cost to no cost programs that um, kind of break down barriers to get more people outside. We provide equipment, we provide instruction, we provide all the things you need in order to be successful outside. Um, and then we also help with some of the big special events that roll through. So that's kind of what Outdoor Chattanooga does. I am Sunshine Loveless. I am the customer relations specialist with Outdoor Chattanooga. Our awesome moderator tonight is Cole. He is a recreation program specialist. He gets to do all the fun stuff and go outside. I get to sit behind the computer and promote it. So uh, he's got the fun job, I got the boring job. But uh, tonight we are going to cover Paddling 101. It'll be an introduction to paddle sports. Uh, very basic, very beginner friendly. Uh, if you've never ever seen a kayak, a canoe, paddleboard, anything like that, um, you're gonna learn all about it tonight. And I think that's it. I kind of wanna, oh, if you wanna introduce yourself where you're from in the chat, please do. We love to know where you guys are joining us from. And I'm going to start with a poll question or two. Oh, you guys have, <laughs> that was up on the screen the whole time. I just realized you guys have already answered it. I love it. Uh, okay. So do you, uh, have you tried a paddle sport? The majority of you have said yes. That's awesome. So I have a good baseline of where you guys are starting from. So 62% said yes. 38% said no. I'm glad that I was just living on the screen that whole time. Again, we are outdoor professionals, not technological professionals. So um, I will stop sharing that. I have another question for you guys, if you want to indulge me. Um, what type of watercraft, for those of you that do paddle, do you prefer to paddle? Love to know kind of, do you prefer the canoe? Do you the sit on top, the sit in style kayak, the paddleboard, whitewater rafting, whitewater kayaking or canoeing, or I've never been in one. That's why I'm here, Sunshine. Teach me what I need to know. Don't worry, I will. Cool, we got about 62% of you. For those of you that are sleeping or went to go get a beverage, run back to your computer right now and answer the question. Uh, we do appreciate you guys taking time out of your busy schedule to spend an hour with us learning a new skill. Um, we really do appreciate that. So thanks for being here. 
All right, 81%, I'll give it two more seconds. 85% are in. Cole, what's your guess? You think most people are in kayaks, canoes? Kayaks. Your lips, I saw it, you're right. So good, like dead even between the sit-in style and the sit on top. And for those of you that don't know the difference, we'll go over that tonight. Um, and for those of you that haven't been in anything, we will um, teach you what you need to know to help pick the right watercraft for you. So that's kind of the results on that. And one more just for fun. What would you guys like to learn most from this workshop? And you can pick more than one option, I think is how I set this up. So, oh, I have to show you the poll. <laughs> All right, click all the buttons. All right, what do you guys hope to learn from this workshop tonight? Um, what type of paddle craft is best for me? How to find paddling locations near me? How to find people to paddle with? What gear or equipment do I need to go paddling? Where I can learn more about paddling and take an in-person class? And then what's the difference between inflatable and solid kayaks and paddle boards. Or maybe it's something I didn't list, something else you'd like to learn. And in that case, drop that in the chat so that we can see it. All right, 89%, 93% of you voted. You guys really wanted to answer this question. I love it. All right, I'm gonna end that and share the results. People wanna know what kind of gear or equipment they need to go paddling. Yes, I love it. We want you guys to be prepared. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go over all that tonight. All right. Thank you guys for answering those questions. It does help me figure out where we're at. Cole, if anything uh, pressing pops up in the chat, please share it with me. Otherwise, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Hopefully we do this correctly. Oh, you guys see me on the, <laughs> on the YouTube. Uh, all right. Cool. Am I showing my presentation screen? Yes. Okay, let's get it in present mode. Intro to paddle sports, virtual workshop, outdoor chaniga. That's what you guys are seeing? Yep. All right, so let's get right into it. Here's what you guys are going to learn tonight. Uh, the types of paddle crafts on the market and what their intended use is. Not all boats are created equally, so they do have an intended function or purpose. So we're going to cover that. The international river scale of difficulty. So knowing uh, on moving water, how difficult it might be and what kind of technical skill or knowledge you need in order to navigate it. Required equipment and recommended gear to take with you. Other considerations, where to go paddling. And guys, just a heads up, since we are in Chattanooga, it's gonna be mainly focused on Chattanooga stuff since we are experts um, on all things Chattanooga outdoors but uh, some of the information will be nationwide. And so you can kind of do your own digging um, if you don't have local. Local outfitters and paddle clubs. What type of paddler are you? So how do I decide which style is best for me? We'll open it up to questions and then give you an opportunity to put it to practice again, if you live locally. So who am I and why am I qualified to teach you guys this tonight? Well, I'm Sunshine. Uh, I was a raft guide on the Okoe River for way too long. It was the best job I ever had, but eventually they tell you to grow up and get a real one, put your college degree to use. So I did that. Um, and then I ended up in social work for nine years. I circled back to outdoor Chattanooga uh, about seven years ago and started doing uh, leading trips as a seasonal guide. And then luckily an a full-time position opened up and I was able to become the customer relations specialist. So not leading the tour so much anymore, but definitely providing all the information and promoting the cool activities that we offer and where you can get outside and play. So I have a few years of experience under my belt and I've pretty much paddled everything possible. Um, so the types of paddle crafts that are out on the market would range from a canoe and a canoe can be used on flat water or white water, a kayak, a paddle board. Some people refer to them as sup or stand up paddle board, a raft. And then you have the option to get boats or watercrafts that are inflatable 
versus solid. And then you have options for boats that are used in flat water situations versus white water situations. So let's get into the difference between them. A canoe is traditionally an open boat that you sit or kneel inside to paddle. The size of the canoe makes it great for multi-day or family adventures as well as solo travel. So this is like the original, I think old school way. A lot of us grew up going canoeing when we were little. Um, those multi-night trips, because we can pack a lot of gear in there, or we can cram the kids down in the bottom of the floor, floorboard <laughs> and take them with us. Uh, so canoe is one style. Kayaks, I think, have become more popular uh, way to get around. They are a boat that you can either sit in or on top of with your legs stretched out in front of you. Um, they are available as a single person or a two person option or tandem as we call it. They can be used on everything from seas to lakes, flat water to white water. They are probably the most versatile um, paddling option available on the market. The top picture are sea touring kayaks, more for long distance flat water travel. And then the guy in the bottom picture is definitely on a white water river. He is in a white water kayak. Paddle boards. This is the newest, um, fastest growing uh, form of paddling out there. Um, if you haven't been introduced to it yet, it originated from surfing. It incorporates a one-ended paddle and it can, the watercraft itself can be used on flat water, white water, or in the ocean. Um, these have come a long way since the initial introduction in the early 2000s. So stand up paddle boarding, a raft, uh, is any flat structure or support uh, of transportation over water it is the most basic boat design. So it's got a no hole on it to displace water. It's just a flat bottom. They're primarily used for navigation in whitewater rivers with a big old crew helping you paddle it because it's a big old boat. Um, they come in a variety of sizes, lengths, and ratings. So there's a couple pictures of rafts there. Most notably in our area on the Ocoee River is where you can find those being used the most. Um, inflatables versus solid boards. So a lot of people do ask us what is the best. The best is what works best for you, right? So um, an inflatable, if you have limited storage, you live in a small space, you lack transportation options on your vehicle like a roof rack or a big old pickup truck, then an inflatable may be a good option because it literally can deflate and pack down pretty small. A lot of times inflatables come with their own carry bags um, that you can roll around um, and just move them a little bit easier. Whereas a solid um, paddle craft is not malleable. Obviously you can't take it apart. Well, I take that back. I have seen some new things on the market that are these foldable kind of kayaks and paddle boards. Uh, I have not personally put those to use, but for the most part, a solid paddle craft means a a solid canoe made of a non-malleable material that's super solid and hard, um, or an inflatable is something that you fill with air and it can deflate and pack down much smaller than when it's in use. Um, technology has come a long way. And many of the high-end brands offer inflatables that are extremely durable and inflate to a PSI rating that mimics a solid board. So a lot of people will be surprised when they stand on something inflatable, it feels rigid feels like a solid board um, because they are able, it, the material is strong enough that you can fill it with enough air that it feels and mimics a rigid board. Um, if you guys have questions on that, definitely pop them in the question and answer and we'll do our best to answer those. Let's talk about waterways versus watercraft. So not all watercrafts can be used on all waterways. Waterways differ from um, seas and oceans, so very open, choppy waters. Um, kayaks, paddle boards are probably the best for those, but paddle boards more for like surfing than touring across an open sea or an ocean. Um, but a sea kayak would be appropriate for ocean touring and sea touring. Uh, flat water lakes, rivers, and creeks, your best options are going to be a canoe, kayak, or paddle board. Whitewater rapids, so any river with white water on it, a canoe, kayaks up raft. 
those, all four of those, they're made very specifically for whitewater. Um, it's gonna look different than what your flat water option will be. And then do you want to be a leisurely paddler or a highly skilled paddler is the terms for that is recreational versus technical. So leisurely would be like a flat water lake, cruising around, I probably have my tasty beverage with me. Uh, I'm enjoying more of the soaking up the sun than trying to get a long distance where highly skilled is gonna be somebody that is like Cole who loves to do class five whitewater and needs to have a lot of technical knowledge and skill in reading water before they get themselves in that situation. So let's talk a little bit more about rapids and the international river scale of difficulty. So this is kind of some terminology that many of you may not be familiar with, but all bodies of water ha are rated in their difficulty. And so that is a classification system starting from one and going up to six. Class one is moving water with small waves, very few obstructions. Um, you could consider a lake, um, a like the Tennessee River that flows through downtown. This is all going to be class one. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of skill or knowledge in order to navigate yourself through or down it. Um, a class two is gonna be a slight bump up from that. Easy rapids with wide clear channels, some maneuvering required. You're looking at getting onto the Hiawassee River here. If uh, any of you are local and familiar with that river, um, it is a still a very wide river, but it does have um, some rocks and faster moving water that creates some rapids. This picture here is actually of the Hiawassee River, and this would be considered a class two rapid that you are looking at. Class three rapid, uh, has higher waves, it's capable of swamping an open canoe. So this person in this picture is wearing a skirt to keep the water out of their kayak. A canoe that's open, the waves would be high enough to come over that and potentially fill it with water. That's what swamping means. And it, a class three would require some sort of complex maneuvering in order to get through it successfully. Hopefully all of that makes sense to you guys. Moving up from there, class four, five, and six definitely require prior training, prior knowledge, prior skill um, in order to navigate those successfully. The picture here is of a class four plus five um, on the Ocoee River uh, from my raft guiding days. That's me pushing some people through Humongous and Godzilla um, of the Olympic section where they do claim they have class five rapids. I think people out west would tell us those aren't class five rapids. <laughs> those are just class fours. So uh, kind of like rock climbing, the difficulty ratings are up to interpretation and some subjectivity. But for the most part, um, class four is going to be a long, difficult rapid with a narrow passage, turbulent water that requires precise maneuvering. That is the Ocoee River for sure. Um, a class five is extremely difficult. My thought process on the East Coast is the Gali River is having class fives. Um, it's long, violent rapids. You are getting tossed about. The river is filled with obstructions. You need to dodge this rock. You need to dodge this major hydraulic. Um, a steep gradient, so the water has picked up speed. It's moving very fast. Um, it can be run by experts in specially equipped whitewater canoes, kayaks, or rafts. But for the average person with their inner tube, they are not going to be successful. Um, and then a class six is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, paddlers basically face the constant threat of death <laughs> because of extreme danger. Navigable only when water levels and conditions are favorable. Uh, the violent white water should be left to expert paddlers with safety precautions. This is the kind of stuff that Cole may be willing to try. I have never, ever, ever wanted to do anything like this. So. Picture your kayakers going over waterfalls. Those are class six. Um, all right, let's get into the one thing that most people wanted to learn about the most. What do you need when you go out kayaking, paddleboarding? Um, the required equipment is obviously 
your paddle craft, what you plan on paddling, a paddle that is your mode of transportation. That's what propels your boat um, from one place to the next. It's your steering, it's everything you need. You need a paddle. A life jacket is required. Um, I'll get into that a little bit more. And then a whistle is also required. Um, it's good to have that on your life jacket and available for alerting people um, when, uh, if any sort, if you're in a difficult situation. If you're paddling whitewater, a helmet is required. If you're paddling flat water, it is not. And then lights, if you ever plan to paddle after the sun sets at nighttime. What's recommended to make it um, a more pleasurable uh, paddling experience would be prior knowledge going out, a cell phone, a map, a compass, so you know where you're going or have a route planned, um, sun protection, hats, sunglasses, dry bags or dry boxes, things that you can stash your phone in so it doesn't get wet and ruined or fall to the bottom of the lake. Um, to stash extra clothes in. If you're gonna do overnight trips in your kayak, you want the bigger dry bags that you can roll down. These are specially made that keep water out the way you roll them down and um, attach them or the dry boxes have this nice rubber seal to them that keeps water out so your things stay dry. Dry top, dry pants or synthetic clothing. You want you want to be wearing things that um, depending on the weather um, and the temperature are either gonna keep you dry and warm or keep you cool if it's super hot outside. Um, a dry top or dry pants are specially made technical equipment that uh, keeps water out and off of you. They range from completely sealed out where no water can get in. Think of people um, rafting down um, you know, rivers in Alaska where they need to stay dry, otherwise hypothermia is a real risk, to um, splash tops that more mimic a raincoat or a rain jacket that will keep the water kind of off of you and kind of repel off of you, but it's not completely seamed and sealed that like nothing can get in. So, and then synthetic clothing is always better than cotton. Cotton holds water if it's really cold outside. It doesn't dry quickly. It doesn't wick moisture quickly. Um, so synthetic clothing like um, your polyesters, your nylons, your wool, those are better to be wearing while paddling. I don't, I don't care if it's summer or if it's winter. Uh, I pretty much always do synthetic over cotton. Um, the saying goes in the paddling world that cotton kills. That's typically for people that are in cold climates, wearing a cotton t-shirt, the rain came out of nowhere, don't have any dry clothes, I can't get warm back up, I'm shivering, my clothes won't dry because cotton just doesn't dry very quickly. So um, avoid cotton when you can. Spray skirt or nose plugs, these are specific to whitewater um, paddlers. Um, spray skirts keep water out of your kayak, nose plugs keep water out of your nose. Very important things if you plan on going upside down in your kayak frequently. Neoprene gloves, booties, or pogies. These are important pieces of equipment for um, cold water paddling. Um, neoprene is a way to kind of insulate and keep your body temperature regulated, um, especially for those extremities that live further away, like your fingers and your toes that can't get as much blood flow. Mm -hmm. Straps, bungees, and beaners. Uh, beaners are carabiners. Um, straps to tie your boat down to your car or to strap um, equipment into your kayak, bungees, uh, same concept, being able to bungee things um, onto your paddleboard or onto your sit on top kayak to keep it with you. Um, and carabiners are just a nice little like easy clip option um, to put a water bottle nearby you um, or things like that. And then racks and trailers for, if, you, if you're just gonna do an inflatable, you don't necessarily need a rack or a trailer, but for those solid, kayaks, those really long sea touring kayaks, or those really long paddle boards, or even those rafts, whitewater rafts, you would need um, either a large trailer or a rack system in order to haul that to get to the waterway, set your shuttle. Um, you can find a lot of that online through various outdoor retailers. Um, if you guys have any questions about any of the equipment or gear recommendations, please drop those into the Q&A and we will follow up with those towards the end.
What are some things that you should think about before you head out? You should think about the weather. You should think about the location and what the water level might be. You should consider state laws. You should think about river features, um, where you can access and get onto the waterway, and then what distance will you be paddling that day? So being your own little trip leader, um, thinking through what you are about to go do before you do it will help you have a nice, enjoyable experience instead of dealing with pop-up unknowns because, oh, I didn't, I didn't think about how I was gonna get into the river or I didn't check the weather and there's a storm coming. So weather plays a big factor in paddling. Um, be sure to use your phone app. The beauty of our modern age is we all have access to cell phones with weather apps and we can constantly check that and stay updated. Where back in the day, we just had to read the clouds. <laughs> And the current meteorologists are not awesome at always predicting and being accurate. Um, I think it's one of the only jobs in the world where you can be wrong the majority of the time and still keep your job. But uh, checking weather apps frequently is important. Um, if you see storms coming and you don't want to get caught in that, don't plan a 10 mile trip where you're stuck on the river until you get to your final destination. Maybe pick an out and back instead. Make it easier on yourself. So precipitation, wind. Wind is something a lot of people don't think about when you are doing open water paddling. So open water would be a lake or an ocean, a big bay, um, depending on where you're up at in New York. Some large body of water where wind plays a factor in pushing you the opposite direction that you want to go. Uh, this is especially occurs when you're on the ocean. Um, so thinking about wind, and again, a lot of weather apps will give you what the projected wind is supposed to be. Um, I find anything up over seven, eight, nine, ten 10 miles per hour, it's tough, especially for leisure paddling, unless you're in a really tight enclosed gorge or river system. Sun exposure, again, if you're doing like a 10 mile trip versus a one hour trip, um, if you're just out in an open water, you want to have sun protection. And then what is the air temperature versus the water temperature? Um, hypothermia, heat exhaustion, these are things that can definitely set in if you're spending a lot of time outside. So we wanna be um, aware and knowledgeable of what the temperature is gonna be and then the water temperature as well, especially if we're gonna submerge ourselves in it in a white water situation. Um, so a lot of this moving forward is going to be specific to Chattanooga. Um, happy to try to find information for anybody that's out of state um, to be more specific for your area. But down here in the Southeast in Chattanooga, the Tennessee Valley Authority manages most of our waterways through a system of dams. And that regulates the water levels and the discharge, the flow. So you can go to tva.gov environment lake levels and find the dam that you plan to paddle below and figure out what the water flow is. For instance, on the Tennessee River, the Chickamauga Dam is above where it flows into Chattanooga. If you check this website, you'll be able to see what the discharge rate is, anything under 30,000 cubic feet per second allows for easy upstream paddling. Every river is different. Don't use that 30,000 CFS for all rivers. The Ocoee is at 1,200 and there's no way you could paddle back upstream against that one. So um, there's also an app through TVA to look up discharge and lake levels. Um, they're also gonna give you information on reservoir depth um, they have a weather app attached to there, so you'll be able to see the air temperature for the day. I don't believe they have the water temperature, um, but a lot of times in the southeast, our water temperature is sitting in the 70s, so it's rather warm. Um, two nearby rivers to us, the Ocoee and the Hiawassee, are also regulated by the Tennessee Valley Authority. They have dedicated release schedules for recreation, which means instead of doing um, hydroelectricity, 
uh, which is the intended purpose of TVA, they release water in order for people like us to go play on it. Um, and so you can check those through this TVA website as well. And then for those rivers in the Southeast that are not controlled by TVA, you can go to the USGS water gauge table and look up information for any creek, any body of water. And this is actually a nationwide website. Um, and they just redid it not that long ago. Um, and you can click on any pinpoint and pull up a local creek or waterway and get um, information on whether the water levels are rising, whether they're dropping, what's pre predicted over the next few um, minutes to hours. Um, super helpful if you are going to find yourself on a local creek. Anytime there's rain upstream, water levels can rise suddenly without warning um, because it may be raining somewhere upstream and that water is just now finally getting down to where you are currently paddling. So looking this information up ahead of time can go a long way in making sure you're safe and well-informed when you get yourself out on the water. Um, again, I will share this PDF um, slideshow with you guys and a lot of these have clickable links so you can access um, the information that's being shared here. If you want one particularly right now, Cole's happy to drop any of those in the chat for you. All right, let's talk about state laws. Again, we're in the tri-state area, Chattanooga. Uh, we're technically in Tennessee, but we are super close to Georgia and Alabama. So those are the three laws, state laws that I have pulled up and are familiar with. For those of you joining us from Arizona, New York, California, I'm not gonna know those off the top of my head. Please look those up before you go out boating in your own area. But both, uh, or for all three of ours, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency, you'll see that link there. The Georgia Department of Natural Resources and the Alabama Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. All of them require anyone under the age of 13 to wear a life jacket while boating. Doesn't matter what type of watercraft and or, uh, yeah, what type of watercraft. That can be motorized boat down to a paddlecraft. Anyone under 13 must wear a life jacket. Anyone 13 plus must have a life jacket on their watercraft, but we are definitely in the boat of it doesn't work if you don't wear it. We never plan to fall in accidentally, right? It happens unexpectedly. And when it does, if you're not wearing your life jacket, it's not gonna do you any good. So doesn't work if you don't wear it. No one mourns if it's worn. All those phrases that all those states have come up with to try to encourage safe boating practices. Um, we are big, huge proponents of wearing life jackets. Whether you have been paddling for 45 years, you can swim like Michael Phelps. You have six gold medals in the freestyle. Uh, you usually fall in unexpectedly and you never know what might happen. It's always good to be wearing it. So the last law that you guys need to know about, nighttime navigation. Not many of you will probably be paddling at dark, but just in case you do, a white light must be attached to your watercraft to make you visible to other boats when paddling in the dark. So Outdoor Chattanooga offers a few nighttime paddles, whether it's out to the bat cave or uh, under the light of a full moon. And we always have a white light attached to our kayaks to make us visible to any other watercraft that might be on the water with us. Okay, Sunshine Enough, where can I find the place to go paddling? I'm ready to go. I got, I got all the knowledge I need, I'm ready to go. Um, the World Wide Web. Again, we live in a modern age. You can find just about anything you need on the interwebs. It is full of info. You might just have to spend a little time looking for it. Um, if you're local to Chattanooga, OutdoorChattanooga.com, activities paddling is your best resource for any sort of paddling in the Southeast within about an hour's drive. We even cover the Nana Hala on that page. Um, so go check that out, get inspired, get information you need to get out on the waterways. The Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency has all of their boating and fishing access sites listed on their website. And it is an interactive GIS sort of map that'll say if it's paved, gravel, overnight parking or not, restroom facilities available or not, um, things like that. 
Outdoor Chattanooga's page will definitely have difficulty ratings on ours for the paddling. The Tennessee River Blue Way is a great um, uh, resource as well. Uh, for those of you that don't know, in between the 46 miles in between Chickamauga Dam and Nickajack Dam, the section of the Tennessee River that flows right through the heart of downtown Chattanooga is considered the Tennessee River Blue Way. It is a navigable waterway that you can do multi-night paddling trips on. There are dedicated places to camp, get out and launch from, so multiple access points and several places to find lodging or camping along the way. So if you ever wanna get um, a multi-night uh, paddling trip in, the Tennessee River is a great place to do that at. It is a flat water option. The Hiawassee River Blue Way is a local committee that wanted to bring more information and awareness to the Hiawassee River beyond just the five mile section that most people get in inner tubes and learn how to whitewater kayak on. So those five miles right below the dam there all the way to where it meets the Tennessee River can be found on HiawasseeBlueWay.com. Um, again, they did a GIS interactive map with the same kind of information, paved lot, grab a lot, restroom facilities, um, things like that. So that's a great resource. And the Hiawassee River is absolutely beautiful. If you haven't gone to see it yet, you should. Um, of course, there's an app for that. Paddling.com um, has a dedicated paddling. It's user fed. So people have to upload information on it. Um, some of it can be outdated. So keep that in mind, check dates. But um, for the most part, it has nationwide pinpointed every single access point for every single waterway throughout the United States um, and provided information like if it's paid for parking or free parking, there's restroom facilities, um, paid, lot, paid lot, all the information you might need to know for the access point itself. So check that one out. If you don't have that in your bag of tricks yet, that's a good one to add. And then old school maps, um, they, they don't fail when your battery dies. <laughs> they're always good um, unless they're paper and you get them wet. So it's a good idea to laminate those, but you can purchase um, dedicated river maps at most local outfitters. Here in the Chattanooga area, we have Rock Creek, we have REI, we have the Sportsman's, the Bass is no longer, wait, no, Bass is still around, but Cabela's is no longer. So go check those places out. You can get really in depth with uh, an, a paper map um, as far as land markers, river miles, all of those things that you might need to um, plan your trip out, especially if you're gonna do a, a multi-nighter. So here in Chattanooga, let's talk about if you don't have your own paddle craft, where you can go rent or do a guided trip. Um, we have a ton in Chattanooga. As a outdoor friendly town, these are a list on the, the left that you can pick from. Battlefield Outdoors, Canoe Kayak, Chattanooga Guided Adventures. Um, they'll either do rentals or guided trips. Um, again, you can find all this information and clickable links to these companies on outdoorchattanooga.com, the activities paddling page. And then on the right-hand side, if you want information about how to go whitewater rafting down the Ocoee River, which is the most commercially rafted whitewater river in the nation, there are 23 companies serving that river. Timetoraft.com is the best website to access and figure out which company you would like to go with. Hiawassee River Outfitters um, and Webb Brothers uh, serve the Hiawassee River and they offer inflatable kayak funyaks um, and uh, tubes, that's the word I was looking for, those tubers, um, for the five mile whitewater section um, from Appalachia Dam down to their outfitters. Um, and then paddling clubs and resources. This is how you can get connected with other people that are currently paddling or getting into paddling um, or to get more information about paddling. So the American Canoe 
Association, ACA is the acronym for that. They provide certification courses, a lot of good information on their website. Chattanooga Area Paddler Meetups and those kind of meetup groups probably exist everywhere. So go to meetup.com and look for like paddling. Outdoor Chattanooga, of course, we provide again, low cost, no cost programs and activities, tours, um, we give you the equipment and we give you the instruction. So if it's your first time ever, Outdoor Chattanooga is a great way to get plugged into that. Once you've tried it once at a pretty reasonable price, if you're like, I love this, I want this to be my new hobby, then talk to your guides that were on your trip and they can help get you plugged into best places to start looking for the type of watercraft you want. Um, Go Paddling app again. We have a rapid learning whitewater program. So if you're into whitewater or you want to get into whitewater, rapid learning is a great place to start. Again, we provide equipment and instruction and guided trips down whitewater rivers, aka the Hiawassee. Reach Rated has a pretty exhaustive flat water um, information section for Chattanooga. The Tennessee Valley Canoe Club, $20 annual membership. You get plugged into all the people that love paddling in the Chattanooga, Tennessee Valley region and get on their newsletter. They do very uh, frequent trips very often. And then the Tennessee Scenic Rivers Association, TSRA, also a really good organization that highlights um, paddling in our region. Again, guys, for those of you that don't live locally, sorry, this uh, we're the experts here, not where you live, but I'm sure organizations like that exist in all the states that you guys are joining us from. So hopefully after listening to me talk for about 40 minutes, you have figured out the difference between leisure and uh, recreation versus extreme technical um, and how to identify what type of paddler you may be. Um, I definitely fall on the left side of this screen. I like that paddleboard with the lounge chair and an umbrella where Cole is going to fall on the other side. He's doing the extreme stuff um, and chasing that white water across state lines. So hopefully you guys have come up with some good questions for us to answer. I think that's my last page. No, I got one more. Um, so Cole, I would love to field any questions from the audience at this point. Don't forget to unmute yourself too. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> awesome job, Sunshine, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see here. So we had a question about pogies. I did embed a link um, for them to take a look at for pogies. You could maybe expand upon that if you want to. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have done that in, in the uh, when I said that word out loud. Pogies. Um, it is a contraption that fits over the shaft of your paddle. It's neoprene and it keeps your hands warm and dry. So think of a kayak type paddle um, where you have your hands out in front of you. And again, your outer extremities tend to get the coldest because they don't get the most um, blood flow. And this is a big contraption that actually holds and grips your paddle for you while your hands are nice and warm inside of that, where it attaches directly to your paddle shaft. So hopefully, Cole, yeah, you were able to find like a picture example of that. And yeah. Hindsight yeah. visual. I, when I did this in person, I would have all that equipment available to touch and see and feel. And I'm sorry that I didn't think to like, put a picture of that in the slideshow this go around. Yeah, it's like a glove slash mitt that fits over the shaft of the paddle and Velcro is on. So definitely good for very cold situations. Um, cold temperatures, cold environments. So you got two more sunshine. Do you see them? I don't. You want me to read them to you? Yeah, please do. Did you, you got them, Cole? Oh yeah, I'd be happy to read them. I couldn't hear you. <laughs> um, what are some good public launch sites on the Chickamauga Lake? Um, I would start at Harrison Bay State Park, uh, Booker T State Park, any of those state parks, obviously going to have restroom facilities, rangers on site, big parking areas, um, monitored by rangers. So your stuff is safe. 
Those are great ones. Um, Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency also has several boat launches, boat ramps along the Tennessee River. You can look those up on their website. Um, and then Chester Frost County Park is another great one that is heavily used um, and a nice like kind of protected cove inlet. So you're not necessarily in the main main channel unless you want to be, you get, you get yourself out of Dallas Bay and into the main Chickamauga Lake. So Harrison Bay, Booker T, Chester Frost are great places to look. And then the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency has a couple boat launches as well. Um, if we're looking any further up, kind of where the Hiawassee meets the Tennessee River, there's, again, that's gonna fall under the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency, so. Um, also on Outdoor Chattanooga's website, the Eric Fleming is uh, awesome. He is with the Tennessee Valley Canoe Club and he put together a comprehensive list of all the access launch points of the Tennessee River Blue Way. And that also encompassed South Chickamauga Creek, North Chickamauga Creek, Sequatchie River, anything flat water, nothing, nothing white water. So you can find white water on North Chick, but uh, these were all for flat water. And you can find that it's an interactive Google map on Outdoor Chattanooga's paddling page, uh, kind of in the top right corner um, of one of the I think it's under the guides section. Um, so click that, zoom around on it, and that will be Chickamauga Lake area. Also, if you just type in the boat launch on Ch boat launches on Chickamauga Lake, you'll see a bunch of pins dropped pretty much from like you said, Sunshine at the Hawassi, um, at the Hawassi intersection into Tennessee all the way down to Chickamauga, and there's a lot of them. Um, so check that out. There's a lot of options um, to choose from and you can pick a pin and find pick, a new spot to go. Pick a pin and go go test it out. And then you'll, you'll start to figure out which spot you personally like the best. Of course, time of day and day of week make a difference on how many people are there, how crowded it gets, how much boat motorized boat traffic you're going to have to deal with. So quiet cove on one day may be a party cove on another day is what I have learned <laughs> in paddling. Mm -hmm. So, all right, hopefully that answered your question. What's next, hit me Cole. How could you go downstream without a partner or could you? Oh, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, it's highly advisable to never paddle alone. Um, again, when you mix yourself with water in any sort of dangerous situation, it's difficult to rescue yourself. So it's always good to have somebody with you. Um, if you're talking about, it's the question about like doing a downriver, downriver paddle and how they get themselves back to their vehicle to where they started. Is that the question? It's kind of what it, it's kind of how it's phrased. How could you go downstream without a partner or could you? I mean, you, you could. So the two types of paddling are an out and back. So whatever launch point I leave from, I'm going to paddle, paddle, and then I'm just going to come back to that. I'm going to go explore a little area, maybe do a small loop out on the lake or, or the river if it's a slow moving river, and then come back to where I started. So that's a way to paddle without having um, a secondary person to do a shuttle for you. A, a shuttle trip is something that you set a car at one place and a car at another place, and then you are paddling from that one car to the next. Um, that does require advanced coordination and probably more than one person. There's a few companies around that will provide shuttles. So for instance, you're a single person and you go up to the Hiawassee Outfitters or Webb Brothers and you reserve um, an inflatable ducky they're gonna shuttle you to the top and you're gonna paddle right back to their property. So there's a few places like that that exist that could give you a shuttle if you're a single person. But we do always recommend um, paddling with somebody else just in case something were to happen, you have another set of eyes, ears, hands available to assist you. 
Nice. Um, what about learning correct paddle strokes per craft, some things on YouTube? Yeah, so this is a perfect way to jump into, or segue to jump into. Outdoor Chattanooga will be hosting an in-person Paddle Smart intro to flat water paddling class on July 29th at six o'clock. The cost is $10 if you have your own kayak, sup, canoe that you want to learn um, how to kind of be your own trip leader and paddle correctly. And then $35 if you need to borrow equipment from us and we're using the style of kayak that you see in the picture that is actually called teaching paddle strokes. So that will be covered in that class. You can always consult YouTube University. Uh, I think any skill possible has been put on YouTube at this point. If you search it, you'll find it. Um, during the pandemic, I had Cole go out with a GoPro and film a bunch of videos uh, for our whitewater program. And he covers the forward stroke um, and a couple other paddle strokes in that series. So if you wanted to visit Outdoor Chattanooga's YouTube page, you would find a whole list of how-to videos on paddling. So either come to a formal in-person class to learn proper paddle strokes and technique or yeah, consult YouTube University and look for a forward stroke, backstroke. Cool, I think you also covered the draw or the brace stroke in there. Yeah. Um, and there's there's paddle strokes that are specific to whitewater versus flat water. Um, but how, he, he demonstrates how to hold the paddle, you know, things to think about, body movement, body positioning, torso rotation, all of those things to consider. Um, in a kayak, which is definitely different than a paddleboard, which is definitely different than a canoe paddle stroke. So it just also depends on the type of watercraft you're going to end up paddling. Yeah, I think you answered that. And having our paddle smart class, or I guess we've changed the name to introduction to paddling. Um, it's a really good just overview of all things paddling from everything sunshine covered to getting in depth on the strokes and getting um, precise strokes and uh, just good instruction on that end. So check that out as well. If you want to do one of our programs, we'd be happy to try and help you out on those things. Another question, sunshine is what's the main functional differences between sit on top or sit inside kayaks when used on non whitewater? Yeah, excellent question. Um, so sit on top kayaks are just that you sit on top. It doesn't have a cockpit that you sit down in. Um, so again, if using the picture that's on the screen for reference, Cole is sitting in a sit-in style kayak. It, it is a recreational style kayak. So it has a big wide open cockpit, lots of room for your legs um, to add you know, extra gear down there with you. Um, a sit on top kayak does not have that. Uh, you are literally going to sit on top of the kayak, not be enclosed, not have your legs covered in any sort of way. Uh, sit on tops, in my opinion, definitely serve the leisure, the um, recreational type kayak uh, or paddler. Um, fishing, people that like to do fishing, kayak fishing, love sit on top kayaks because they're more stable. Um, they're kind of more of a, a flat bottom without the, dis the hole to displace water um, versus the, the style you see coals in the orange one. Uh, it has that really defined hole in the front, um, which helps you track through water much faster, whereas a sit on top kayak is not going to have that. So it's going to move slower, but it's going to be more stable. So if you're new to the sport, versus um, sea touring kayaks are going to be narrower, longer. So they're going to be made to go long, long distances, but they're, they're going to feel, especially if you're new to it, a little more tippy, and they're going to have a much smaller cockpit area to sit down in. Yeah, and I, I don't know if you said this, Sunshine, but just to continue that thought, um, my mind, the main difference in my mind would be that the sit on top, obviously, like you said, applies more to the leisure side and the sit inside 
you have the ability to use a spray skirt if you're wanting to go on like an overnight trip or if you're wanting to keep water from getting inside your boat or you know on your lower body you can have that spray skirt on the boat and that serves you know a, a great purpose if it's cold weather and it's the winter time and you want to keep water off your body and have a dry top on and all those kinds of things so that would be a big difference with your purchase of the boat if you want a boat that's going to be you know your body half your body is going to be in the kayak and you can cover it with a spray skirt and keep it dry then a sit-in kayak might be what you want to look at for overnighters and things like that but if you're looking just for leisure and you're wanting your legs to be out in the sun then the sit on top kayaks you're probably going to be up your alley yeah but, that's um, cool. another great distinction uh cole uh definitely for those in colder climates i think the sit-in styles became very popular because you can use that skirt and you can keep your body really warm and dry sit on tops are definitely made for ocean uh, hot water climates and leisure kind of thing. Uh, not trying to get far distance. You're just out there paddling around having some fun. You're not worried about being cold or anything like that. So, uh, and then the sit-in styles typically have hatches, what they're called, the little compartments that you can stash gear or equipment in. Um, these are also good for those multi-night trips. Um, or, you know, taking your sack lunch with you, a small cooler out onto the water with you, where a sit on top, you're just gonna have this like flat base. Um, so you're gonna need extra bungees or straps to secure your gear. Um, you're not gonna have a, a compartment, so to speak, to fit anything into. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of it. The um, other question really was just referring back to something asked earlier about YouTube University and REI pages for more paddling information, but I think we've kind of covered that too. Um, yeah, that's all we've got on the board right now. Cool. Well, uh, I mean, we're pretty close to the eight o'clock hour, so I hope that you guys learned something new tonight um, that maybe you didn't know walking into this. Um, and hopefully it gives you the confidence to uh, go out and try this skill. And if not, uh, reach out to us at Outdoor Chattanooga and pick our brains. We'll, we'll be happy to uh, provide any additional information that you might need in order to get yourself out on the water. Um, I, For me personally, water is my favorite place to go. It's, it's got healing qualities. Nature therapy is what I call it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I've, I just always feel drawn when I'm having a bad day or um, feeling super stressed out. Going and paddling on the water just always makes me feel good. Uh, it's kind of like mountain biking. It's one of the two activities I can do where everything else in the world just dissipates for a little while, which is really rare and hard to find these days. Um, and I think the pandemic taught us all that going back outside is super helpful and beneficial to our mental and physical well-being. So the more time we can spend outside, the better. Um, I think I saw a question pop up about, do you need to know how to swim in order to travel? Um, <clears throat> you don't. Um, I've actually taken a lot of people paddling that don't know how to swim. Um, you should wear a life jacket. <laughs> and so if you trust your life jacket and your equipment, it will bring you to the surface. Your head may go under for a minute, but a life jacket will keep you afloat um, as long as you're conscious. So you do not need to know how to swim. And for the most part, if you are starting out in flat water situations, you're not going to the extreme side of the sport. Um, you can keep yourself in the watercraft and not even end up in the water. But on the rare chance that you do end up in there, if you're wearing a life jacket, you don't need to know how to swim. When you are looking for life jackets online, because a lot of us do online shopping instead of going to physical retail stores, make sure it is Coast Guard approved. Make sure it has that rating. I know like the number one shopping store is Amazon these days. Amazon will sell you just about anything cheap make sure it's Coast Guard approved, that they have that rating on there. Um, life jackets range from class five commercial, which is what um, whitewater rafting companies will put their guests in. Super big, super bulky. It's gonna have a pillow on the back to keep your head afloat, all the way down to low profile, 
um, type three. I would not suggest going any lower than a type three life jacket, um, especially if you don't know how to swim and you do plan to get into paddling. I would highly recommend going with a guide service outfitter, um, Outdoor Chanuga, for instance, because we do have ACA certified instructors um, that are qualified to teach you and guide you, give you kind of the technical skill you need to keep yourself upright in a watercraft and safe. One more question, Sunshine, if you've got the time, where can I find boat in camping spots? Like, you know, paddle to your camp spot on the water? Yeah, Google it, <laughs> uh, depending on where you're at. So I don't know who asked the question or where they're, where they're at. Uh, my favorite style of paddling. I love finding a paddle in campsite. I don't know why I feel like I've won the lottery every time I find a new one, but I do. Um, yeah, for those of you that need to go, thank you so much. We, we did just hit the eight o'clock hour. Thanks for spending an hour with us. We really appreciate it. We will follow up with the email that includes the recording, um, links, um, and a survey um, to let us know how we did tonight. Um, and then, of course, then you'll have our contact information to ask any follow-up questions. Um, but to find a boat in campsite, um, there's a lot of people that write guides, um, paddle guides, um, going to a particular location. So I'm about to go visit uh, the state of Washington. You know, I just, I Googled a lot of things in order to find it. Um, unless you know the area really well and you know what the local resource is, what website to land on, it's kind of hard. Go Paddling sometimes has that information, um, but typically I'm, I, I look at the body of water and then I, 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 I Google to see if a paddle in option is available. Um, for service websites, <laughs> they're terrible, but um, they provide a lot of information, deep buried, that you can actually find like on the Lake uh, Parksville, for instance, on the Ocoee. Um, apparently most of their shorelines you can paddle and camp out on without a permit, without anything. Um, and so I recently learned that by like literally scouring the Forest Service website because it falls within the Cherokee National Forest. So don't be scared to spend a little extra time on a website to find the need. Um, yeah, I like, I've done boat in in the state of Washington, boat in in uh, a Carter's Lake has some in North Georgia, um, and done boat in on um, Dantille Lake uh, up in North Carolina. Uh, the French Broad has multi-night, um, paddling information for their river. Um, they also promote a, a, a beer, <laughs> like a brewery tour. So you can paddle and like hit up several breweries along the way. Um, but that is set up to be a multi-night. And then for the Tennessee River itself, um, there's several websites that showcase the camping locations along the way for um, those overnight boat in kind of options. So, I know that's not the best answer to give you, but uh, Google it. <laughs> All right, I just posted the, um, the survey for this presentation. If you're still on and following with us, if you would go in and take the time to survey this presentation, we would really appreciate it. Again, we appreciate your time and still staying a little bit over. Um, this survey just lets us know how we did and how Sunshine did. We all know she did great, but if you want to give her some feedback and let her know any points or anything that might have been left out that we can know in the future, we would greatly appreciate that. Yeah, thank you guys. And don't be scared to go find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, smash the like button, subscribe, follow us. Um, get notified if uh, you filled out the sign-in sheet tonight um, and you selected yes to sign up for our newsletter. I get sent out once a month, highlights all the cool things we're doing, as well as other awesome events going on in Chattanooga. For those of you that don't live locally, next time you visit, you'll be uh, inspired to get outside and do something cool in Chattanooga. If you guys have any follow-up questions, 
feel free to reply to the email that we will send out probably by tomorrow. And yeah, thank you. We appreciate you guys spending, spending an hour with us and learning a new skill. So thank you so much. Uh, and if you do want to sign up for Paddle Smart, Cole, did you drop that? Um, uh, let me double check really quick. For anyone that is interested for the Paddle Smart coming up July 29th, Cole will drop that link in right before we sign off. And if you don't live locally, I'm sorry. I hate it for you that you can't join us for that class. Um, but look up uh, if you have an REI in your neighborhood, in your neck of the woods. REI offers all kinds of experiences and guided tours. So again, a nationwide option that does exist. Um, but otherwise, uh, Paddle Smart is a great in-person class that will extend beyond just this virtual option, what, what we're limited to do virtually with you guys today. So with that, snag those links before we sign off. Thank you guys, we appreciate it. Thanks Cole, I appreciate you. Absolutely, I appreciate you son.